So last Sunday, right after service, someone approached me and wanted to share a truth that had hit them like a ton of bricks. Eyes were open to something never considered before. It was this. In our time of prayer, I had prayed God's forgiveness on those things that we had done that we shouldn't have done. In other words, the sins of commission, right? You've heard that expression before, committing sins, the sins of commission. And then I prayed God's forgiveness for the things that we didn't do that we should have done. The sins of omission. The truth of this really struck this person profoundly. They had never considered that before. That one can not only sin by doing wrong, but sin by not doing what is right. And that is what confronts us in today's scripture lesson. So our scripture le lesson, lengthy as it is, is quite an interesting collection of thoughts and conversations and stuff. It takes place on the Sabbath. Now, Jewish Sabbath rules or laws were very strict indeed. Sabbath laws prevented me, do, you or us or them from doing all kinds of things, namely that anything that considered or could be considered work was strictly forbidden. They bring it back to the earliest of, of creation when God created the heavens and the earth in six days. On the seventh, then God did what? He rested. But rest in that sense it's different than the way we think of rest. I mean, can you imagine God kind of being tuckered out after six days and saying, man, I got to chill for this day, you know, heels up, you know, recliner back. I am really beat. This is really, no, that's not what we're thinking. It doesn't necessarily mean that God, tired out from so much work, needed to sit down, catch his breath, or rest. What it does mean is the seventh day, God did what? God ceased from working. There's a difference. But anyway, as humanity always does, always likes to do, we want to push the boundaries. We want to push the margins. Okay, the law says stop right here. Well, we want to push that just a little bit, don't we? And so the Jews pushed against the laws to the point where the laws became very, very complex and convoluted. They had to write down with, with detail what you could and what you couldn't do. Since ceasing work lay at the heart of Sabbath law, doing medical activities were strictly forbidden. Unless, of course, a person was at the risk of death. Since this particular man was born blind, right? Blind from birth, he didn't need emergency care. And so the Pharisees took issue with Jesus for healing him on the Sabbath. They thought Jesus should have told the blind man to call his office on Monday morning and make an appointment like everyone else should do. Make an appointment for a consultation, schedule tests. You know, we've all been through it. We all have doctors here in the sanctuary. They know <laughs> what we all go through. And then finally, Jesus could schedule then an, a, a, a date, an appointment, to do this particular procedure. Which, of course, could not, would not ever be allowed to be done on a Sabbath. Well, Jesus was just passing through. Come on, you know. He's on his way to some, someplace else. He sees this poor blind man. And besides that, he didn't think too much of all the hoops that he needed to jump through to be considered a proper religious leader. He just wasn't going to go there. So he did what he thought best. He spit in some mud, mixed it all up, rubbed it in this man's eyes, and told him to wash into the pool, in, in, in the pool of Siloam. And the man did just that, and guess what? He was healed. Much to the chagrin of the religious leaders. As with Nicodemus and Jesus, who had this earlier conversation we talked about a few weeks ago, they had this disjointed conversation between physical and spiritual things. 
Jesus and the Pharisees in today's lesson have a disjointed conversation about blindness, physical and metaphorical blindness. Jesus told them, I entered this world to render judgment, to give sight to the blind, and to show those who think they see that they are blind. To which the Pharisees, they caught the message. It wasn't that subtle. They caught the message and asked, are you calling us blind? Well, Jesus thought, if the shoe fits. Jesus was fed up having to do the things which were considered right in the eyes of the religious institution. Rather, he decided he needed to do and was going to do what was right in the eyes of God. He saw a need and he met it right then, right there. I want to draw your attention to three groups of people in our lesson. First of all, well, the three are the disciples, the neighbors, and the Pharisees. As Jesus walked along, he saw a man who was blind from birth. Jesus' disciples asked, Rabbi, who sinned so that he was born blind, this man or his parents? It seems the disciples weren't all that interested in helping the man. They felt the need to theologize about his condition. Did he or did his parents sin that he was blind from birth? Then after that, Jesus healed the man, and we see another reaction. His neighbors and others who knew him as a blind beggar asked each other, isn't this the man who used to sit and beg? Some said he was, and others said, no, he just looks like him. But the beggar kept saying, yes, I am the one. The neighbors weren't all that much interested either in the actual healing of the blind man. What they wanted to know was, was it the guy that we used to see down at the, at the pool, or, or wasn't it? I mean, no. And then the Pharisees chime in. So the Pharisees also asked him how he was able to see. The man told them he put mud on my eyes for the umpteenth time. I've told you. I'll tell you again. I've washed, and now I see. So what's peculiar or particular about this? It doesn't seem that any of the three groups had any real interest in the person of the blind man. The disciples wanted a theological debate. The neighbors wanted to know his identity, and the Pharisees wanted to know how it happened and why it happened on the Sabbath. Spiritual blindness. Nobody ever thought to help or even pity the man. And after, his, after he was healed, nobody even thought to praise God for the healing. Favorite uh, Fred Craddock puts it this way. What the disciples wanted to do was not help the man, not look to Jesus for changing the man's condition, but discuss it. Everywhere you go, there are people like that. They'll change the kingdom of God into a discussion group. Who's going to make the coffee next week? And the church becomes a great book club. So, can you see where I'm kind of going with this? It relates back to this opening illustration. The disciples, the neighbors, even the religious leaders did not believe they were doing anything wrong. They just weren't doing anything right. And Jesus calls them out for it. Just who is the blind one here? The sins of commission and the sins of omission. The Pharisees were so so quick to call out the sins of commission. Jesus, you can't heal on the Sabbath. That's a sin. Didn't you know that? Jesus, you can't have your hungry disciples gleaning wheat fields on the Sabbath. That's a sin too. Where did you go to seminary? Jesus, stop hanging out with sinners and tax collectors. You're not supposed to do that. God forbid we would never do that. 
On the other hand, the Pharisees were blind to their own hypocrisy. They were oblivious to the needs before them, or if they were aware of the needs before them, they ignored them. They were more concerned about doing the right thing when actually the right thing to do stood right in front of them on a daily basis by the pool of Siloam. Here we see the sin of omission on full display. People more interested in talking about than doing anything about the needs of the world. The Catholic Church defines the sin of omission as the failure to do something one can and ought to do. The Bible defines it this way. It is a sin when someone knows the right thing to do and doesn't do it. So, to make perfectly clear, if I haven't done so already, the difference between a sin of commission and a sin of omission is just this. A sin of commission is going over to your neighbor's house and burning it down. The sin of omission is what? Watching it burn. It reminds me of the story of the Good Samaritan. A man gets beaten and robbed and left by the side of the road on this particular road to Jericho. A Levite and priest pass the beaten man by on the other side of the road. Along comes this hated Samaritan and cares for him, bandages his wounds, takes him to an inn, and pays the innkeeper enough money to keep him there for a few days. Now, we know that the priest and Levi, Levite had justifiable reasons not to stop, right? According to Jewish law, these leaders, if they touch blood, they would become unclean. They'd have to go through all this, this terrible thing of, of cleaning themselves. But the point is, they did nothing. They walked by him on the other side of the road. And so which is the greater sin? Intentionally stopping to care for the beaten man? when you know that that is going to put you in an awkward position back at the church by becoming unclean and unable then to perform your religious duties at the temple? Or is the greater sin the passing by of the beaten man, ignoring the needs of someone right in front of your face? Jesus makes it very clear. I was hungry, and you didn't give me food to eat. I was thirsty, and you didn't give me anything to drink. I was a stranger, and you didn't welcome me. I was naked, and you didn't give me clothes to wear. I was sick and in prison, and you didn't visit me. The sin of doing nothing. John Piper, a retired pastor from the Twin Cities in Minnesota, um, and also provost of the Bethlehem, college, I believe, that he uh, actually started. He speaks on the sin of omission as it relates to racism, our theme for Lent. It is not good enough for people to simply not be racist. We must systematically oppose racism when we see it, even when we're not indirectly involved in it. We sin when we allow racism to continue and don't speak out against it. This inaction is sin. All around us, evil only thrives when good men and good women do nothing. So here's the challenging question before us today, one that we've talked about in Sunday school over the several weeks of, of our Lenten season, one that I continue to struggle with and seek God's guiding. How do we do more? than just book studies? How do we do more than just discussion groups? How do we do more than attend those kind of conferences and seminars? How do we do more than just ignore racism, hoping it will go away? How do we do more? And I believe our church, West Richmond, has reached this point. Where do we go from here? What is God's will for us individually, 
and corporately. You know, inaction is an action, right? By doing nothing, you are doing something. It is an intentional choice to maintain status quo. And of course, Jesus had something to say about that too. Truly, I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Let us pray. Gracious, heavenly, creator God, maker of all things in heaven and on earth, we praise you, for you are indeed a wonderful, powerful, loving God. You sent your son, Jesus, as light in a world of darkness. May we, those who love him and follow him, may we see that light and follow it. And may we, in our association with that light, be light for others. Help us in knowing the next step, O oh God. What is it that we can do? We can't just sit by and do nothing. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.